Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together to celebrate the good work that you've done in the gospel. We want to worship you because you are worth everything we have and more. So we thank you that we can lift our voices, we can lift our lives to honor you. You call us to lay ourselves down on an altar, present ourselves as living sacrifices who get up off the altar living for you. So we thank you that you have paid the great cost, the death of your son, to rescue us from our slavery so that we could be free to worship you, free to live for you, free to praise you and to give you all that we have and all that we are. We long to do that this morning. As we open the word together, would you speak? Would you teach us? Would you instruct us? Would you engage with each one of our hearts here? Show us what we need to see. Show us our Savior. Show us again what you have done for us. Show us our need for salvation, our need for grace, moment by moment and day by day, and help us to respond to you with thanks, with praise, and with obedience. We honor you this morning by our presence here and by our desire to listen to what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Children can go on down to Junior Church in the South Wing and Toddle Time downstairs. And uh, we will have a baptism after the sermon is over. And we'll bring the children back in so that they can see that at the right time. So we've been walking through a new series here together over the past few weeks called Church 101, taking us back to the basics, what it means to be the church, what the church is, how to function as a church. The church is the household of God, the family of God. Our church gathering on Sunday mornings is the get-together of Jesus' family. So welcome home, as it were. To be together with your family in this place week after week is a great privilege, a great blessing, and a great opportunity for us. The family business, we learned, is magnifying God, loving one another, and witnessing to the world around us. When we get together on Sundays, and perhaps every other time as well, we seek to magnify God as we worship Him together. Last week here, we looked at one of two ordinances of Jesus for His church to practice until He returns. One thing that He told His church to keep on doing over and over and over again until He returns, the family meal, the Lord's Supper. Today, we consider the other ordinance Jesus commanded His followers to practice, water baptism. The church practices water baptism to celebrate and picture what happens to each one of us when God saves us. So this morning I want to raise a couple of questions and address them and answer them from the Scriptures. First of all, why do we baptize? Why do we baptize? Let me suggest four biblical reasons. First, we baptize for celebration. For celebration. Something amazing has happened that should thrill us all. A person has begun to trust in Jesus. Baptism is a kind of ritual or ceremony, a celebratory ritual, very similar to celebrating a birthday. You may remember the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip stumbled onto this eunuch's chariot where the Ethiopian was reading from the book of Isaiah. Philip took the passage he was reading and explained how it pointed to the gospel of Jesus. The eunuch understood what Philip told him and believed the message. And his response was to ask to be baptized immediately. So they stopped the chariot, and Philip baptized him in a pool of water nearby. And then we read these words in Acts 8, 39. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing, celebrating, excited for what had happened to him. Likewise, The Philippian jailer, after he and his family were baptized, set a meal for Paul and Silas and rejoiced 
along with his entire household, that he had believed in God. Baptism provides an opportunity for celebrating what God has done in Christ for a new believer. Yes, the the joy and the celebration is in the salvation, not in the pool of water, but that something amazing has happened. We take a moment and do something special and different to celebrate and to rejoice. So the first reason we baptize is for celebration. Second, we baptize for public confession. Public confession. How do you tell people you're a Christian now? Certainly, you can just say those very words. I'm a Christian now. But if you want to show people what has happened to you, God has designed baptism to provide a clear picture. Throughout the book of Acts, as soon as a person responded to the gospel by turning away from their sins and to Jesus in faith, repenting and believing, They were baptized in water, usually with other Christians watching. After Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people became Christians. And Acts 2.41 says, So those who received his word were baptized. So we baptized, we baptized for public confession. Third, we baptized for proclamation. Proclamation. Romans 6 4 helps us see what the symbolism of baptism means. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Buried with Christ, baptism into death, new life. The new Christian goes down under the water, Just as Christ went down into the tomb, truly dead, the new Christian rises out of the water, just as Christ came out of the tomb, alive forevermore. The imagery of baptism paints a picture of the gospel events, and the person baptized is acting out what has actually happened. As Josiah is being baptized today, he is telling us, that God has united him to Jesus, and that Jesus' death was his death, that Jesus' death counted for him, that Jesus' resurrection also counted for him. It was his resurrection. He is showing us a picture of God giving him new life. He will also share his own testimony, what God has done for him in his own words. Consider also that Paul connects our union with Christ, specifically with baptism, in a letter where he's addressing believers who've known Jesus for quite a while. In the context of Romans 6, Paul is emphasizing our freedom from slavery to sin, and he's encouraging believers to live out of their new identity, dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. How does baptism play into that for the believer? Well, I think Paul points us back to our baptism as a way of strengthening our assurance. How does that work? Baptism in water paints a picture, but it is also an experience that you physically feel. You get wet, and you can remember that. It becomes an aid for remembering. When God unites us to Jesus, the moment we begin to trust in Him, usually nothing physical takes place. There's not necessarily a tingling sensation in your body. You look the same on the outside as you did the moment before you trusted Jesus. But years later, you might be able to remember your baptism in water. You might be able to look back to that moment, to that day, when you painted this picture of the gospel by letting another believer in Jesus dunk you in water and then pull you back up. And I think Paul wants us to look back to our baptism as a sort of rite of passage, a celebratory event that we could look back to in the moments when we might doubt our salvation when we're having a hard time remembering that we really are dead to sin and alive to God. And we can look back to our baptism and say, Self, I remember 
testifying of my faith on that day. I remember that God had united me to Jesus through faith. I remember that I was telling those who were watching that I had trusted in Him. I remember that I was buried with Him in the water of baptism. I remember that I was signifying my death with Christ, that He died for me, that His death was my death, and I acted that out in the water. I remember painting that picture, and I remember being dragged up out of the water so that I could walk in newness of life. I remember that. I was there. I felt it. I said the words, I went into the water. Those things really happened to me. My baptism told the story, painted the picture, and I remember that. So, even though the water doesn't save us, even though the water doesn't change us other than getting us wet, it can be a pillar in our memories of how God saved us by grace through faith in Christ. And we can look back to that pillar experience and be reassured in our faith. We can remind ourselves of our commitment to Christ and find strength to stand firm against temptation. So, we baptize for proclamation. And that proclamation can ring out even in our own minds through the years. Fourth, we baptize for obedience. Now, typically when baptism is talked about, this is the one that gets all the press. This is the one that's emphasized. I've left it for last so that we can remember all these other glorious biblical purposes for baptism. But yes, it is also an act of obedience. Do you remember the story of the day of Pentecost? We've already mentioned it. The Holy Spirit first came down to live in the followers of Jesus in Acts chapter 2. Peter got up to preach and explain what had just happened. And he pulled Joel 2 from the Old Testament and explained that God had poured out His Holy Spirit on the disciples of Jesus. And then He reminded His Jewish listeners of the Gospel about how they, they had murdered the Messiah just weeks before. God was at work in these Jewish listeners and they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter what they must do in response to his sermon. He said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice that Peter commands them to be baptized, to let one of those who were already a follower of Jesus, those who already received the Holy Spirit, to dunk them in water. This was a command. It's not optional. Now, we recognize that it's not the dunking in the water that saves sinners. Nevertheless, it is a command. The other important passage that makes this clear is when the resurrected Lord Jesus, after receiving all authority in heaven and on earth, commanded His disciples what we call the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. "'Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations.' baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Notice four things. First, the command to make disciples is addressed to all disciples. Jesus mentions three aspects of making disciples, and it seems that they should be highlighted in the order that He mentions them. Go, baptize, and teach. First, we go. Christians first reach out to other people. They go to other people with the gospel message. Then when people respond to the gospel by trusting Christ, they baptize. And then they teach so that the new disciple grows up. Second, notice that Jesus commands all disciples to make disciples by going, baptizing, and teaching. All disciples, not just pastors or ministers or leaders. The only qualification a person must meet to baptize someone according to Jesus' words is that you must be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Third, notice who is to be baptized. The them, after baptizing, 
almost certainly refers back to the word disciples. Disciples baptize disciples. Followers of Jesus baptize followers of Jesus. Finally, notice in whose name disciples should baptize. The one name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is important because we want to remember and acknowledge the work of the Father in adopting Josiah as His Son. Jesus the Son. We want to acknowledge the Son of God paying the penalty for Josiah's sins. And we want to acknowledge the Spirit for giving Josiah new life through the Gospel. Now, in observing from the Great Commission that disciples baptize disciples, we should see here an exclusion of the possibility of infant baptism as a practice that has any spiritual meaning or value. Of course, saying that expresses a fundamental disagreement with many Christians, churches, denominations, and church traditions. Briefly, I'd like to kind of pull off the road and take a look at the biblical arguments often used to support infant baptism and show why I don't think they're convincing. And I'm focusing on infant baptism as practiced by Protestants. I'm ignoring those who believe in what's called baptismal regeneration, that being dunked in water is a part of what God uses to save sinners, to give new life or to cause a spiritually dead sinner to be born again. For the next several minutes, we're thinking about Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, and other Reformed churches. First, the book of Acts refers to a few household baptisms. It is often assumed that these households probably had young children or infants living in them. But each example indicates that household baptism follow responding to the preached word. The most important of these examples is probably the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. After Paul and Silas stopped the jailer from committing suicide because the jail cell had miraculously been broken open, and he had assumed that all the prisoners he was responsible for guarding had surely escaped, he asks Paul and Silas the absolutely wrong question. We pick up the story in Acts 16.30. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Do you see how that's the wrong question? What must I do to be saved? You can't do anything to be saved. But Paul and Silas met him where he was and answered his wrong-headed question. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household. Now let's pause there for just a moment. At this point, Paul and Silas have not communicated the gospel message to this jailer. The jailer is a Philippian, that is a Roman citizen, probably a pagan worshiper of idols. He, had he ever even heard of the Lord Jesus? And it's likely that he would have been immediately offended by that title. Because for him, Caesar is Lord. So when Paul and Silas say, believe in the Lord Jesus, the jailer doesn't know who they're talking about and doesn't know what he needs to believe about this Lord. Also consider the jailer's question. What does he mean by asking to be saved? In this moment, he's thinking he's going to be executed for falling asleep on his job. He wants to be saved from punishment by his Roman superiors. He's not thinking, what must I do to go to heaven when I die? He's not thinking, how can I have a relationship with the true God? He's not thinking, how can I get forgiveness for my sins and have eternal life? He's simply wanting to get out of trouble and possibly escape death for his mistake. When we think through the context of this conversation, it is more than unfortunate that we can sometimes quote these verses out of context in evangelistic appeals. To command someone, believe in the Lord Jesus, and to promise them, and you will be saved, is not the gospel. 
That's not evangelism. You've merely told people what to do. You haven't told people what God has done for them. That's where it's important to keep reading into verse 32. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Ah, so now the jailer has taken them into his home and they have everyone's attention. So they preach the gospel to the jailer and to all who were in his house. Now verse 33 can be properly understood. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Evidence of his new birth. Evidence of his faith in Jesus at that point. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. When we hold verse 32 and verse 33 together, we can see clearly, I think, that those who were baptized were those who responded to the word of the Lord that Paul and Silas had proclaimed. This means that those being baptized were old enough to understand the message and believe it which excludes the possibility of infants being included in the picture. The same thing happened in the household of Cornelius when Peter and some Jewish believers baptized everyone in Cornelius' household who are described as all who heard the word in Acts 10.44 and these people who have received the Holy Spirit in Acts 10.47. Likewise in Philippi, It is said of Lydia in Acts 16, 14 that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And then she and her household were baptized. If the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, shouldn't we assume that is what happened to the rest of her household as well? Finally, in Corinth, sometimes Acts 18, 8 is appealed to, which says... Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. If Crispus and his whole household believed, then that seems to exclude the possibility of infants, right? And the implication seems to be that those who believed were then baptized. And it is only those who believed who were baptized. So, the mention of household baptisms in Acts as evidence for infant baptism is not convincing, since, in every case, context seems to clearly indicate a response to the gospel of those who were baptized. The other main argument for infant baptism is a theological argument that comes right out of traditional covenant theology that goes all the way back to the Reformers, John Calvin, and Ulrich Zwingli in particular. Basically, and without fleshing out all of the details, covenant theology views the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant as essentially parallel outworkings of a greater reality called the covenant of grace. Now, you won't find the covenant of grace in the Bible. You won't find that phrase. It's not a biblical covenant per se, Rather, the phrase covenant of grace is a way that theologians have tried to tie together all the promises of God to humanity together. This is one way of explaining how anybody has eternal life at any time in history being given through faith in the sacrificial death of the Messiah, whether in Old Testament times or in New Testament times. Covenant of grace is a way of tying all of that together. For the reformers and proponents of covenant theology today, there's an almost complete and exact continuity between these biblical covenants so that they can be spoken of as different administrations at different times of the one covenant of grace. The implication of that perspective is that the nature of God's people under the different covenants is essentially the same. This belief necessarily results in a belief in infant baptism because the promises 
to Abraham are made to Abraham and to his offspring, his children, so that the children of Abraham, even as infants, are full members of the Abrahamic covenant, and therefore, they reason, the new covenant must be for believers and their children, even as infants. They draw a biblical basis for this from the first part of Acts 2.39, where Peter says, For the promise is for you and for your children. In studies of infant baptism, usually the rest of the verse is not quoted. The full verse reads, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And that final phrase, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself, seems to qualify the previous phrases. Also, since the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant are viewed as parallel, then the signs of the two covenants are parallel. Circumcision, as the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, was to be applied to baby boys descended from Abraham on the eighth day of their lives in this world, according to Genesis 17, 12. Thus, it is argued, baptism, as the sign of the new covenant, should be applied to babies of believing parents as well, though, of course, no one would limit this just to baby boys. Biblically, Colossians 2, 11 and 12 is pressed into service for this point, where Paul writes, In him also you were circumcised, with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, I I don't see here a comparison between the physical circumcision of the Abrahamic covenant with baptism of the new covenant. Rather, Paul seems to be speaking of what is called in the Old Testament the circumcision of the heart and suggesting that that is actually the foundation, the prerequisite even, for undergoing baptism with water, which, as we've said earlier, depicts our union with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. What do Presbyterians, for example, believe is the benefit of baptizing the babies of Christian parents? Since the covenants are viewed as parallel, the people are viewed as parallel. As there were unbelievers who were members of the Old Testament covenant people of God, circumcised members of the nation of Israel, yet idolaters and unbelievers, so we should expect and allow for unbelievers to be members of the new covenant, the New Testament covenant people of God. Thus, in their view, our unbelieving children can become members of God's people even before they believe in Jesus, even before they believe in God, even before they believe anything at all. This, in their view, is based on parents asking the church of which they are members to sprinkle water on their baby, and then their baby becomes a member of God's kingdom, a member of God's people, but they don't believe this saves from sin. They don't believe the Holy Spirit comes to live in our unbelieving children when they are baptized as infants. What promises of the new covenant actually come to a baptized baby in the Presbyterian covenant theology view? I can't think of any. Promises have to be believed, after all. I'd like to close that door and shift gears ever so slightly. I suspect, and I don't know this for sure, but I suspect there are some in this building who have not been baptized since you became a believer. And I'd like to challenge you this morning to consider your reasons. What is preventing you or hindering you from taking that step? I'd like to challenge you this morning to consider why not? Why not be baptized? The Ethiopian eunuch famously said, after he heard Philip's explanation of Isaiah 53 and apparently responded with faith, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? I'd also like to challenge the parents of some children who are trusting Jesus but have not been baptized. 
I've heard lots of reasons why believers wait to get baptized. Let me address a few of them. Some, children especially, are afraid. Your children might be afraid of talking in front of a big group of people, sharing their testimony, or some of your kids might be afraid of water. Those are legitimate fears. I myself am afraid of water. I've almost drowned twice in my life. As to the fear of public speaking, I don't get that very often. (laughs) But I know that we can help anyone get through those fears for something as important as this. Can I be direct for just a moment? Fear that keeps you from obeying God's commands is sinful fear. Parents, don't ignore your children's fears or tell them just to get over it, but help them overcome their fear. Most of all, parents, don't let fear remain an ongoing excuse for your child's disobedience to Scripture or your own, for that matter. Do you let them hold on to excuses for not obeying other areas of God's Word? Secondly, some wait to be baptized, and usually this too comes from parents, because the believer may not understand baptism. At least that's what I'm told. And I I understand, but I really just want to ask, really? Really? If someone understands the gospel sufficiently to believe, then why can't they understand the meaning of baptism? Is it that they might not understand baptism completely? We don't need to understand it completely to do it. Understanding is not a prerequisite for obedience. I understand baptism today way better than I did when I was baptized in 1997. Remember the Great Commission? Baptizing comes before teaching. Of course, we want them to understand what they're doing. Do they have questions that you as a parent are not sure how to answer? Widen the field. Get help from your brothers and sisters. Come bring them to me. Bring them to Pastor Ken. Bring them to an elder. Bring them to anybody who's been a mature Christian for a while and hammer those questions out. Your children's questions about God and the Bible are important. Don't dismiss them or ignore them. And if you can't answer them, get help. Prioritize getting those questions answered. They're important. I think baptism can be explained simply enough that a child can understand what's happening. Now, often I perceive a combination of fear and misunderstanding, or maybe better, a fear of misunderstanding. Some parents seem particularly afraid that their children are going to become confused about how baptism is related to their salvation. And there is much confusion about how baptism is related to salvation. I readily admit that. But parents, you can be confident in the context of this church family at least that we're always working toward clarity. We're always seeking to unpack the truth of Scripture. And we'll keep doing that with your children as well as with you. But think about this. Are you concerned that your child might become confused and think that she's saved because she prayed a prayer? In most cases, when parents lead their children toward believing in Jesus, they help them pray some form of prayer, right? Did the prayer save them? No, it did not. Now, I do find many Christians confused on this point as well, that that the prayer did save me. And I think this confusion is cultivated by certain evangelistic practices and tactics, radio preachers who regularly tell people, pray this prayer, and as long as you meant it in your heart, you are definitely saved. Furthermore, I suspect that many of you parents command your children, direct your children, and expect your children to, quote-unquote, say their prayers and read their Bible, do their devotions, and that's good and right. But why not challenge them to obey this command of the Lord Jesus as well? This is really one of the easiest commands in the Bible to obey. 
Your children will please Jesus and honor the Lord by letting you, as their father or their mother or some other Christian, dunk them in water in front of the church. And they never have to do it again. It's a one-time deal. The question on the table is, what are you waiting for? At the same time, baptism is a way of expressing your faith, painting a picture of what has happened to you spiritually in salvation. You've been united to Jesus, and you're ready to show the world. But for the one baptizing, for the parent, for the witnessing church, we also are affirming you in your faith. We are saying that we see evidence that you really are united to Jesus. And it is wise not to rush that in our children. It's easy for a child to do anything, especially something that actually looks kind of fun and easy, and other people are doing it if it will please their parents or others that they admire and respect. And that creates a possibility for confusion or deception. Thus, it is wise for parents to wait until you have confidence that you are seeing evidence of faith in your child's life. More than a mere profession of faith is required. There must be faith in the heart. And where there's faith in the heart, there will be fruit in the life. Not perfection, but genuine transformation. Now, as we conclude this message this morning, I'd like to invite the ushers to bring the children back in here from downstairs and from the south wing. And yes, Ken, you can go ahead and take Josiah into the water. I want to end where we began. This is a celebration. Baptism is like celebrating a birthday. When we celebrate birthdays, we throw a party. We bake a cake. We light candles and blow them out. Why do we do that? You ever thought about it? Why do we do that? I, Cora Schmidt had a birthday a few weeks ago. I was at the party. Didn't stay long enough to see the cake and the candles. I assume there were some, maybe. And it may have been that as she turned nine years old, she had a cake with nine candles lit. And then she came up there and she blew them out. Why did she do that? What did that symbolize? Blowing out nine candles symbolizes, and hang on to your hearts, Andy and Sally, if you're listening, nine years of her life are gone. And a new year of Cora's life has begun. The time for looking back has been blown out. And it's time to step forward into a new year. Baptism, which we typically only experience once, is like that in that it symbolizes the end of our old life. However many years that represents and the beginning of eternal life. We are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, not the waters in the tub. And we live forever connected to Jesus. Ken Shutt is about to have the privilege of baptizing his son, Josiah. And since this is a celebration, church, I have instructions for you. When Josiah rises up out of the water, I want you to cheer. I want you to clap. I want you to shout as loud as you possibly can. I want you to holler. I want you to cheer like you would if the Buffalo Bills had just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Not yet. Wait. Because they haven't yet. I want the folks living at the bottom of the hill to hear that something amazing is going on at Alfred Alvin Bible Church. We are celebrating what God has done in Josiah's life. Here is water. Let nothing prevent this little one who believes in Jesus to be baptized. I'm going to attempt to move this pulpit somewhere out of the way. Oh, I need to unplug it. Good call. That's why it's... 
Maybe that'll be good. Indeed, uh, this is, uh, I get to do this a lot. Um, through the time I've been here almost 10 years, baptized a lot of people. <laughs> this one's a little different. Um, I've been able to watch this guy grow up closer than probably anybody else, obviously. He's been in my home. Um, it is very exciting to me, and many of you have congratulated me, uh, but I wanted to start by saying this has nothing to do with me. This has everything to do with Jesus. Jesus saved me, and now he's saved my son, and he's here to proclaim that today. And just as you heard as Pastor Justin shared, what we're doing today through baptism is, uh, it's, it, it means something. It means something to all of us, because we're all his family. Yes, I'm his father. In blood, sure, but you are his family as well. Some blood family, some not. But either way, we are a family in the Lord, and we have an opportunity today uh, to celebrate together as Josiah has decided to follow Jesus first and foremost. That's the important thing. And then following him through obedience and showing that today through baptism, as Justin just talked about. Uh, and so I can remember, uh, just a minute, I'm going to let you, sh I'm going to let him share his testimony that he's written down. Um, but I, I remember, uh, the journey that Josiah has taken. He's going to tell a little bit of his testimony of where he really knew that he needed to know Jesus. And obviously we've taught him at home, but didn't want to push him to do something that was just his parents' faith, but actually would be his own. I remember when he was just six, he called me into his room and asked me if he was a sinner. And I told him yes. <laughs> that was pretty obvious. Um, and I don't even know if he remembers it all, but I remember when he realized he was a sinner, he just started crying. And he was upset and realized he needed Jesus. And I don't know at that moment if he fully understood all the gospel or not. It seems like it took a little bit longer before he grasped it. Uh, but from that moment on, it's been a privilege to watch Josiah grow up, not only as a young man as he's growing, but also into knowing Jesus more and more. And so with that being said, it is my great honor and privilege to baptize him today. But again, it is not about me. It's not even ultimately really about him. It's about Jesus. But it's about, it's about, it's about Josiah's uh, commitment to him. And so today, I'm glad that you're able to join us. With that being said, I'm going to let Josiah say a few words. Um, don't get electrocuted, okay? And he's just going to share with you um, what Jesus has done for him. Go ahead. I have had very little life before I was saved, and I can't remember most of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, God saved me at Circle C Ranch. The first night of chapel service, Way, Wayne Aram went in front of everybody and talked about how um, we're all sinners and deserve to die. Then... He talked about how we don't have to die because Jesus died and rose again on the third day. Then he called whoever wanted to be saved to go up there with him. So I went up. Then he paired me up with someone and he asked me a series of questions. Then he told me to say a prayer to God to forgive me and ask him into my life. Then I was saved. One of the verses upon which I base my salvation is uh, Romans 3:23 through 24. It says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through redemption that is in Jesus. All right, Josiah. I'm just going to ask you a few questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll dunk you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a, a few questions with what you just said and I just respond yes if this is true. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And are you committing to walk in the newness of life that he has given you? Yes. All right, well, based on your profession of faith, this way, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 